Thank you very much for uh, um, being here. It's a pleasure again. Thank you, Michaela and Andrew and Avaido for having this again. It's really cool. Um, as you can see, I, this is the third time, so I must like it somehow. Um, thank you for coming this late. It's after uh, dinner time, and we have been here for many hours. Um, so thank you for, for doing that. Hello to everybody uh, that's away. And thank you for also listening to everything that we are uh, saying. So I sent the title for my presentation before actually planning what I was going to say. It's, uh, and so I will start by addressing the title, and then I will go into a completely different direction, which was what I wanted to do. <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. I think they are related, um, so we'll see. I'm not. This is, again, the third time that I do a presentation here. I, I'm, I wasn't sure how many of you would be the same, how many of you would be different, how many... Uh, so I didn't want to do the same kind of pre presentation as I did the other two years because I thought, oh, God, poor them. Uh, there's, a, there's a limit to how many times you can actually listen to the same things. So, um, but I still need to introduce myself, and this title is very uh, uh, appropriate because I am married to an immunologist and I am an artist. And so this long, uh, long life uh, relationship is uh, um, real. Um, and so um, you will see, hopefully, I will go straight into the projects that I do with him, and then you will understand also how that affects my understanding of art uh, and how I make art as well. Um, just to introduce you briefly to me, I am an artist. I did a very classical painting degree in the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Lisbon. I have no formal background in science or biology, but my studio um, practice uh, project for my graduation was already in a, in a biology laboratory of evolutionary biology. Uh, my, two, my main interest is identity. Um, identity is a concept that most of us seem to think it's very um, dated, uh, or that we have somehow sorted what identity is. I disagree with this very strongly. I think uh, also because um, uh, I, I'm very passionate about it because I feel that biology is challenging every preconception that I have of what identity is. And I also am a very strong believer that the better you know yourself, the better you're able to also make choices of who you want to be. And this is not just at an individual level, but as humans. So if we know ourselves better, then hopefully we will also uh, be able to bet, make better choices for the future. Um, this choice of identity does somehow relate to uh, my immunologist husband. Immunology is uh, pretty big on identity, and I will explain a little bit later. I've gone through many different laboratories, I, so ever since my first a, a project in a, in a biology laboratory. I never left the labs. I never had a studio until last year. Um, my studio was always uh, a laboratory of someone else. Um, and, uh, and because identity was, was my thing, it also meant that I went through evolutionary biology, cell biology, proteomics, uh, genetics, plant biology, microbiology anything that would challenge my idea of um, what identity can be understood as was interesting. It was only in 2014, so well into our marriage, that, I, uh, that a project came into being where it made sense to work with my scientist husband. And this project is called Immortality for Two. So I was asked today, what do I do as art? And when I say I do art with biology, people have a little bit of difficulty to understand what that may be. Um, and it's a lengthy explanation. Um, so 
this is a, an example of, of what I do with biology as an artist, because I still make art. So immuno, uh, Im Immortality for Two was a project that I uh, uh, was interested in because I was fascinated by this idea, which I understood by reading uh, science, uh, uh, um, science uh, uh, articles, but also the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. So HeLa cells are a cell a type of cell, a line of cells, which are very commonly used in biology in all over the world. They're called HeLa because Henrietta Lacks was the primary source for that line of cells. They are a cancer, uh, effectively, and they, the source was uh, 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 a, a cancer of the uterus of this uh, African-American woman um, in the 60s. And uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and the, the title of the book is very uh, provoking, um, is because there's more cells in the world of <laughs> Henrietta Lacks than she ever had. Uh, and so um, this idea of this immortalization of a person through the cells that are actually cancer cells was fascinating for me. Why did they decide to call cancer immortal cell lines, and I do understand the reasons. Basically, um, a cancer cell does not know when to stop dividing. So a healthy cell has a number of cell divisions that it goes through before it accumulates too many uh, mutations, and then it dies. A cancer cell doesn't have a functioning biological clock, so it doesn't stop dividing, and this is why they call it immortal. In, in society, this is a little bit difficult to understand, and it's a little bit, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was not ironic, but it can be understood as, as damn ironic. Uh, and so, what is this immortality? How can we understand this? What is the desire to become immortal that we seem to have as humans, always? Um, and um, there's a, you know, it's now you don't have to take primary tissue from cancer to get a cell line. You can actually induce the, <laughs> the cell line by inserting oncogenes into any type of cell, and you will get a, a, an immortal cell line. So my proposal to try and understand this immortalization through a very mortal disease was, can I do this to myself? Can I take cell, cells out of my, my own body and make them immortal. What does this mean? How do I relate to this? And what does this make me think in terms of the identity that I bring into these cells? Uh, for health and safety reasons, this is not allowed. I cannot experiment with my own cells. And it's very low risk, but it is still a, res a risk. And there's a risk that I will reabsorb these cells uh, in the process of making them immortal, and I would effectively get cancer. So I don't want that. I think it's very good that we have health and safety uh, regulations like this. So how does this project move forward if I can't do it? I can probably ask a scientist to do it for me, and the health and safety would be solved. But that doesn't add anything conceptually to the piece. And thinking about this, it made me really realize that who wants to achieve any kind of immortality alone? Who would I choose to share immortality with me, no matter what that means? And Luis, my husband, was the, and still is, the choice. Um, <laughs> So this was the moment that it made sense for me to work with Luis on a project that is very much about sharing a process of immortalization. And because he's an immunologist, there is the ironic twist to the piece itself as well, which is we did it in parallel. So I transformed Luis's cells into an immortal cell line. He transformed my cells into an immortal cell line. We did it one after the other. 
It's a very simple protocol. And um, he's an immunologist, so the cells that we chose to transform are cells from the immune system. And so even though we have gone through the process of immortalizing each other's cells as a shared experience, because they are cells from the immune system, they can never be in the same place together. Because as the immune system, as some of you may know, is the, the organ in your body that differentiates self from non-self. And as such, the cells of both of us would attack each other if they were in the same place. So there's a price for this immortality together, which is isolation. The pieces shown, as you see here, um, there's some, some pretty cool, not very advanced technology, but pretty cool nonetheless. So you have the two flasks, with, which look like what you see on the top uh, image over there. And our cells are alive inside these flasks, and they can last, can last without change or without us having to take care of them for about two weeks, and, and they propagate, so they keep on replicating, replicating, replicating. And in the gallery space, they are alive and replicating. And so they are on opposite sides of the table because we cannot be together. Uh, under each of the cell flasks, you have a small microscope that uh, we built, that I built with a microscope uh, expert from the Faculty of Medicine in Lisbon. And that each one of these microscopes is, is attached to a computer that's connected to the projector. So what you see on the table actually are the live projections of the cells dividing. And the only place where they are, where we are together, is the digital overlap of the two projections. So this is how we overcome the price of isolation. This was a project that we did together, but it was a project that we both enjoyed loving, uh, 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 doing together very much, and it didn't put any risk into our relationship. So soon after that, well, a few years after that, in 2017, we listened to this gentleman give a presentation in Lisbon, and this was one of my husband's heroes. Um, <laughs> John van Ruth uh, was a Dutch uh, medical doctor and immunologist as a researcher who's actually the father of transplantation. My husband did his PhD in, in the UK uh, in transplantation, so this was quite an important person for him, and he took me to see this talk. It was actually the year that John van Ruth passed away, um, and, uh, and he was a very... Uh, he was a very good speaker, and he was at a stage in his life and career that he could be very humorous in his presentations without the risk of uh, 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 losing any credibility. Uh, he's the reason why we are able to do transplantation today, because he found that his lab helped um, <clears throat> describe uh, the human leukocyte antigens. And the human leukocyte antigens exist or uh, uh, serve the purpose of finding a better match between an organ and a recipient. He was also the father of urotransplant. And so this is, this, this is quite an important person. And it was very funny because he said that it all started with this idea of amongst members of his lab, do small skin transplants to follow the rejection of the skin. This, would not, this was in the 60s. Yes, this would not be allowed today. But the reason why we have uh, clinical transplantation now um, is because they did do these experiments. And uh, when we got home, and this is where the story is very different between if you hear Luis talking or me talking. Luis said, why don't we do a transplant between each other? And he has a lot of artistic ideas, a lot of 
maybe I shouldn't say it like this. He has a lot of ideas that he <laughs> that are for art pieces. Yes, it, way before we met, he already had those, and he keeps on throwing them at me, and most often than not, I will say, I think that's a great idea, you should do it. Do not ask me to do your art. So in this case, I had that moment where, okay, this is a piece that makes sense for my artistic interest or not. And it wasn't very long, the, the, the moment of reflection, because it made perfect sense. So. By this point, we had been together, married for 20 years. We had been together for a little bit over that. And I don't know with you guys, but I need uh, uh, periodically self-affirmation. That I need to remind myself that I am not us. I am me. So every now and again, I, yeah, yeah, I scream, I shout, I say, I don't care about you, and go away, and I'm, I'm ha I've had enough. Um, and so, for me, this felt actually very perversively like the perfect affirmation of self, using his research field to uh, reject his skin. Uh, and, and even more sublime, it meant um, that it was not my mind or my emotions who were affirming my identity. It was actually my immune system. How, can, how more categorical can you be? <laughs> this is me. And so the piece is a surgery that we uh, did. Uh, we exchanged skin. There's a self-transplant. There's a, 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 a transplant between each other. And we don't reject our own skin, but we reject the other skin. This was expected because of the experiments that John Van Roo did. We knew exactly what was going to happen. We knew to the detail that I was going to start rejecting three days before Louis started rejecting because we have kids together. And his immunologist friends really like to make the joke, couldn't you find a more complex way to prove that the kids are yours. <laughs> He's a complex person. Um, and so, <laughs> um, I don't really want to, um, I don't want you to have to listen to this. It's, um, it's a very beautiful piece that was not made by me. The piece actually shows as uh, the surgery was filmed, and so we would, we obviously not going to do the surgery again. Um, so how do you show a piece that is on your body, inside your body? And, uh, and, and so the, the choice was, we will film the surgery, and we'll offer the opportunity to the public, by choice, <laughs> that if they want to, they can experience at least visually what it feels like to be transplanted. And so the surgery is projected onto a table. You see it on the image over there. Um, and you are able to see the whole surgery, follow the whole surgery and how the skin exchanges uh, places. It's quite gory, yes. Not too much blood. I thought it was going to be a lot more bloody. Um, and, uh, and then you have the the, the documentary, and I'm just showing you this because I think it's important to um, just to understand that the, the documentary starts from very different perspectives. It's a dual video. And so we, the, the videographer who did this to, for us, Jamie, was very smart in making this a dual of two perspectives that eventually become one. Because this is probably the project where Luis has had enough experience with artists because he's not, I'm not the first artist he worked with 
to feel comfortable enough to uh, produce artistic content. Until, well, the, the project before, uh, it was very clear that I was taking care of the art side of how things were going to be exhibited, and he was taking care of the technical side of protocol and storage of the cells and how to propagate the cells and blah, blah, blah. Here, I've just told you that for me, this project is about the affirmation of self and how I am me. He's a romantic person, fortunately, and he is much more um, romantic than I am. And he will explain to you that rejection is a temporary thing. Rejection is fast, it takes a month, and rejection is over. What is important, and for an immunologist this is fundamental, is what is left in the body. So both the memory cells and the antibodies that are produced through rejection will always be with both of us. I am the only person in the world that has memory cells and antibodies to recognize Luis, and he's the only person in the world that has the same for me. And this is incredibly powerful, but it's very unscientific in a way. Uh, or a way to put it is very unscientific, it's very romantic, it's, you know, he will say it's a lifelong commitment between the both of us, much more lasting than a ring that you can lose. Um, uh, and so, and even more lasting than a tattoo. So, it was, it was really interesting for me to to do this. Of course, this means that we have the next the next project, which will be tolerance. And he spent two years saying that every time I spoke, I said, so, next project, tolerance. And he would say, that's impossible. Oh, come on. Now we have actually started the process of making tolerance, and I'm not going to talk about it, because, again, this is where I deviate. Like I said before, I spent over 20 years with this person who's very passionate about what he researches on. I have spent 20 years in science laboratories. And I don't know about you, but in the Faculty of Fine Arts in Lisbon, when I was learning, it was very, I was, it, I was, I learned very fast not to ask the question, what is art? It's a minefield for an artist. It's a minefield to teach. And you can learn about aesthetics, and you can learn about philosophy. You can learn about many different things. But you do not ask the question, what is art? Because nobody has, and they all think that they need to have a consensual answer. And so as an artist in the science uh, uh, environment, which I spend most of my time, I'm always asked, I think it was one of the first questions that I was asked was, why do you say that what you're doing is art? Explain to us why is this art? What makes it art? And therefore, what is art? And so it took me <laughs> a long time to come to terms to, to try and, and make sense of this myself, and also make sense of, of an answer that I could give that people would understand a little bit. Um, and it came from Luis, again. So living with an immunologist means that you understand that the immune system is the most creative organ in your body. And there are many answers for this affirmation, or many explanations for this, this affirmation. One of them is the, the immune, cell, uh, immune system creates cells with edited DNA, and it's the only organ in your body that can actually do this. The immune system, system differentiates self from non-self before you're self-aware. And this, for me, is mind-blowing in terms of identity. What does this... What, 
does this bring to the plate of who we are? Um, and he will be very provocative and say, the immune system is perfect. And every time I hear him say this, I say, please don't say perfect. And he says, no, I will say perfect. You just have to understand that perfect is not closed. Perfect is open. It's perfect because it is open. An immune system is able to deal, a healthy immune system, is able to deal with everything that it has encountered before and able to deal with everything that it will encounter forward. And this is when light struck in my brain, because I can understand art like this, or I can use this in my understanding of what art is. Art is everything that has been, it has been before. Nothing stops being art because it's no longer what is being done. But it still has the ability, the dynamics, to become everything that it will be in the future, whether we know what it is or not. And for me, in terms of knowledge, this is the most powerful characteristic of art that it will always be something else, that it will always be everything that it has been before, that one does not conflict with the other. Because in science, that can cause issues. In any field of knowledge that is fact-based or consensus-based, this can become a problem. In art, we are not facts-based, we are not consensus-based we're not statistically relevant either. <laughs> but this is actually what I believe is the most powerful thing and what cannot be eliminated from the field of knowledge as a whole. Because if knowledge can never be understood as a whole, if you don't have some of the knowledge being produced that is not fact-based, statistical relevance, or consensus dependent. So knowledge is important. I think we all understand this. Or I'm a, a very, uh, uh, um, I'm a fan of knowledge in general. And knowledge is important for history, but we all also know that history is what we have left. And this is a very striking example, but history is written by who writes it. What about those who were there but didn't write or were not written about? As an artist, as a woman, I feel very strongly about this. Um, I, I can't help it, <laughs> in a way, to feel that women artists existed women artists exist, and they're still not represented enough. Um, and the wor it's, it's not a matter of quality, it's not a matter of relevance, so something needs to change. And in my own little world, there's very little that I can do in a big scheme of things, but um, I do like to think that I can do a few things. And one of the things that I started when I, after traveling and coming back to Portugal was this institution, Cultivamos Cultura. And Cultivamos Cultura is in the south of Portugal. It was clearly a strategy that I had, strategy that I had to do to make sure that I kept in contact with my peers. As an artist who works within the field of science, it was very difficult to me to come from abroad back to my country and connect with the artists here without having to explain again, I do art and biology. I work with living materials to make art. I do things like transform the wing patterns of live butterflies. I do things like paint chromosomes and, and, and 
draw patterns inside the nuclei of human cells. I create proteins that never existed before and actually make them into a protein, a molecule, not just a, a prediction or anything like that. So, but I did have peers that were all around the world. So I was fortunate enough to have a space in the south of Portugal that belonged to my family where I could host people and I could create a cultural association that would then allow me to host my peers to come to me. And this was the beginning of Cultivamos Cultura. And now it's a completely different thing. Our website uh, was out of date for a long time, just like my website is, and, and just like most of artists' websites are, if they exist at all. Uh, and this is not a, uh, an artist website, so it sort of made me... Uh, but one of the things that was quite important for a cultural association like Cultivamos Cultura, it's in a natural park, it's in a protected area, it's in a village, it's a rural community. Um, and what we could offer at the beginning was strictly accommodation, because what we had was house and space. And so... Um, Artists actually came, my colleagues, my peers, uh, uh, started coming and spending time at Cultivamos Cultura, doing some research, developing some projects, and they would leave us works. Works of art that kept, we, have, we had to keep them. It was part of, it felt to me that it was part of our responsibility to show them to the public. These are artworks. These are art artworks from amazing artists from around the world, so we need to show them. And then we started to get funding from the Ministry of Culture, from the local uh, um, municipality. So this is taxpayer money. They need to understand what we're doing here, what they're spending their money on. So we need to exhibit these works to the local population and not just the local population. We need to really show them. So a collection became the source for multiple exhibitions. We now have four, year, four exhibitions per year in Portugal, around four to five exhibitions per year around the world. And we have a growing uh, collection of artworks that have very specific characteristics because a lot of them are based or made with living material. So we have freezers and we have fridges and we have pieces that go into storage and need to be revived for exhibition, which is a strange thing to think. Um, and so now it's up to date. Our first archive is our website. Everything that we do, every activity that we are involved in, in appears on this wall. Um, but we have around 20 residencies per year, which means around 20 new artworks per year. So what do we do with this? And um, a year and a half ago, we won a European project to create Archive. Um, archive is... Why can't... Where everybody has access and they want to deep dive to a digital platform Podcasts, interviews, exhibitions, protocols, best practices, case studies, and even symposia. Then, you also share your own resources, things that you learned, where all the community is there. Institutions, artists, curators, researchers, students, professors, and scientists. People curious about living things and processes. It's all about arts and biomedia, a knowledge base. A shared, open, ever-growing space. Be part of Archive. Bring it to life. And, uh, and so we partner up with um, five other institutions. And uh, four of them are sort of your usual suspect, suspects. One is an IT expert, which was the institution that built the platform. It's completely open source, so on the 
on the website, you can actually look into the programming that went uh, um, into doing this. Um, it's called Hangar, and it's based in Barcelona. Then we have galleries and curator uh, associations that are incredibly uh, um, experienced in producing and exhibiting artworks like the ones uh, uh, I just told you, Biomedia. But they don't have a collection, so we are the leaders because we started this with our collection. And then um, the odd one out, which actually, if you think about it, makes perfect sense, is the Natural History Museum in Brussels. And why does it make sense? Because they have an enormous amount of specimens, most of them dead, but still alive because they're decaying permanently. They're being degraded on a permanent basis. And these are the experts, the researchers, that can help us really set up guidelines and best practices on how to document these works. So archive is not about showing these pieces as an exhibition would. Archive is about rethinking what documentation of art is, what documentation of art that is dependent on media, and this is not exclusive to biomedia, needs to have in term to be well documented. We now have different technology. We cannot remain stuck in photographing exhibitions or uh, archiving the texts from the catalogs. We need to rethink what is necessary to truly document a piece. And the museum, when they document their piece, they actually do um, 3D uh, uh, digitization based on photogrammetry or any other techniques. So we learned from them, and they actually were very challenged by our works, um, because they usually their artworks are dead, or their, their specimens are dead, and ours are very much alive. And we also do, for every uh, residency, something that I'm very uh, fond of, which is microdocs. So every residency that goes through Cultivamos Cultura actually has a microdoc done with the artist themselves. And I don't want to. <laughs> uh, they're not very long, but if you go on Vimeo and look for Cultivamos Cultura, you will have, I think, around 50 now um, microdocs done of all the artists that have been there. The artworks are absolutely amazing, and, and you will fall in love with them. And you will fall in love with the artists talking about what motivates them to do. And this is, again, I, what I think is absolutely fundamental documentation. <laughs> Sorry. Fundamental documentation of contemporary art because we have the artists with us. And so to even try to overcome the forgetfulness of history, we need to document now. We need to make the history now. Um, and of course, and we have actually the main responsible for this part here in the room. Nono is hiding over there. And uh, so he's the, 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 the person in charge of digitization, and it's mostly based on photogrammetry, but also a lot on Blender. And the idea is that we can now create a flow chart or a diagram of questions. So what is in the artwork? If you answer one of these, then you have another set of questions that you need to answer. What, if it's a, a, a life, a, um, uh, an art piece with a life cycle. What kind of documentation do you want to make? What kind of documentation do you think it's important? Do you need to document the whole life cycle? Do you need to document multiple life cycles of the piece? And how do you document the multiple life cycles of the piece? Do you make videos or do you make 3D renderings of the whole piece? How do you document the beginning of the piece? when you seed the cells of the fungi? 
Do you actually document the growth of the fungi even be before it becomes a piece? Do you document the writings of the artist? Archive is actually designed so that the artist becomes a user and they can document their own artwork. And this is our point, is that it's not us who are curating the archive. It's whoever wants to put their artwork there. And there are how-tos and there are ways to challenge and, and give us feedback of, actually, I need this kind of tool. Can you give us this kind of tool? You are also in charge of how much access do you want to give? Do you want to just archive it there? Or do you want it to be accessible to anybody who wants to see your piece? Maybe you have parts of your piece that are fine for public view, but maybe you want your um, reflections or your lab books or your di graphic diaries or your notebooks from that piece to be archived in terms of documentation, but only be made available if someone is actually doing an academic paper on a specific thing. If there's enough people in archive, they can actually, we can actually start looking into, okay, during that year, there was a number of artworks that were focusing on ocean, but there are very few exhibitions Or where were the exhibitions on climate change happening when climate change was happening? So our objective is to, to grow archive. Over the next four years, I'm hoping very much that we will be able to grow archives, the archive, into something that manages itself. And I leave you with that. You're very welcome to, and you're invited to become a user and to try and understand what is the documentation of your work that is necessary to be produced and uploaded into something like archive. How much of it do you want to make it public? How much of it do you want to make it private? Or uh, what are the levels of knowledge that you want to share? But one, it will make you understand where hopefully, I think it's very important to document the work, <laughs> but I'm an artist, so I'm crap at it. Uh, but I'm learning how to be better <laughs> all the time. So thank you very much. <laughs>